Good morning. Good morning. You guys are getting better, at least. That's good. Thanks for joining us this morning as, uh, as we worship together. We're really glad that, uh, that you're here with us today, and we want to thank you for joining us. I just want to call your attention to, to one announcement, and that's the uh, ladies' tea that's coming up. Hopefully, ladies, you got a, a little flyer on that as you came in over the last couple of weeks. Um, they'd like everyone to RSVP by tomorrow so that they can know how many to plan for. So uh, there's some information on that in your bulletin. You can sign up um, out in the lobby after the church service, or you can do it online. And uh, we want to encourage you ladies to, to take uh, part in that and have that fellowship time with some other women. So a lot of other things coming up. I invite you to... Uh, Take a look in your bulletin, see what's going on, find a group where you can study the Bible with someone else, where you can get together in fellowship with others. That's always an important part of what we do. This morning as we uh, begin our time, we're reminded of the fact that Jesus, when he, as he spoke to his disciples, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. This first song, really, we're just going to sing scripture back to God this morning as we sing. Way. So would you go ahead and stand with us as we sing? It's a new horizon. 
As we just sang, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Perhaps, had those word, perhaps Peter had those words in mind when he said this to the religious leaders who were trying to keep him from preaching. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved.
wasn't just in the New Testament that we learn about lifting up the name of God. We see that in the Old Testament with the psalmist as well. So would you go ahead and read with me the words of the psalmist. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever.
Father, that's what we're here for today. We want to glorify and lift up the name of Jesus. The name that's above every other name. The name by which we must be saved. We come before you today to acknowledge that we're completely, Father, at your mercy because we're totally unworthy of of being saved on our own. There's nothing that we have to offer you. Yet, Father, you love us. You shower us with mercy and grace. You give us far more than we ever deserve, Father. And so we come just to say thank you, to give praise to you, to honor you. And Father, maybe just to get to know you a little bit better today, I pray that we would do that through your word today. That we would go away from here today just knowing a little bit more about who you are, that we might not just know about you, but that we might know you, that we might be able to have deep fellowship with you, Father, not just for an hour on Sunday morning, but all throughout the week. So, Father, we just ask that you would use this time to do all those things. Father, we want to bring you glory with our lives, the glory that you deserve. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. all the smiles this morning. That's better. Well, I brought something with me. Do you guys know what this is? A ruler? Okay, what else? What do you think, Mia? It's a thing to measure how long things last. Okay, a thing to measure how, it can do that. What else? What do you think, Haley? Okay, to measure, do you know what it's called? It's called a level. <laughs> a level. Because we use this to make sure things are level. So why is it important that we make sure things are level? Like, let's say you were going to put up a shelf at your house. Why would you want to make sure it's level? What do you think, Tyler? That's right. If the thing's tilted like this, if you put up a shelf, what happens? Everything falls right off, right? So you want it to be level. And there's a little, see the little bubble in there? There's a little gas bubble and there's some liquid in there. So let's see at the stage how level this is. So if you look down there, you can see it's actually pretty level, right? The bubble's right between those two lines. Can you see that? Can you guys see that? Here, I'll put it over here so you guys can look. See over here, this bubble? See, it's right between the lines. So now what happens if it wasn't level? If it's like here, what happens? The bubble's not between the lines, right? And so we always want things to be level when we put them up. Now, there's some walls in this building, I can tell you, that are not real level, having worked with them before. (laughs) Yeah, some of them are not supposed to be, but you want things to be level. And what's really interesting is if you try to balance this level, it's hard to do, but there's only one way you can find a balancing point. That's you have to get it right exactly in the middle. See if I get a little one way or the other. But if I get it exactly in the middle, which is really hard to do, it'll, it'll balance exactly level. And that's to remind us, and that's right in the middle because it's 18 inches long, so 9 inches right in the middle, right? And that's to remind us that if we want to have balance in our life, if we want our lives to be level, who do you think we need to put in the middle of our lives to be balanced? What do you think, Josh? That's right. If we put God in the middle of our lives, if we make Him the most important thing, then He'll make us level. He'll keep our lives balanced. So let's, next time you see this, maybe your dad or your mom's using this to build something or to put up a shelf, you can use it to remind you that we want to keep God at the center of our lives. Let's pray. Well, I do pray for all of us. You'd help us to keep God in the center of our lives so that our lives would be balanced around him. We thank you that that's possible through Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
This week I was uh, reading an article by a pastor and theologian R.C. Sproul, and, and in that article he was talking about the time when, when he learned more about God's mercy and grace than probably any other time in his life. He was talking about when he was uh, first teaching in seminary, and it was his second year teaching, and he had a class of freshmen, and in that freshman class there were 250 students. It was an Old Testament class. And on the first day of class, he took out the syllabus and he explained to them, he said, there are going to be three midterm papers that are due during the course of this class. Five pages long. The first one will be due on September 30th. The second one's due on October 30th. And the third one's due on November 30th. So September 30th rolled around. He said 225 of the 250 kids came and they turned in their, their papers that day. But there were 25 students who weren't really ready. They didn't have their papers ready, and and they really appealed to them and say, hey, look, we're we're new to college. We're really sorry. We just haven't managed our time real well, and so we could could really use a little bit more time to finish up our papers. He said, didn't I tell you? I told you right at the beginning, if you don't turn them in on time, your papers are going to get an F. He says, but I'll tell you what, just this one time, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give you three more days to turn in your paper. So he did that and it came along now to October 30th when the second paper was due. Well, this time, only 200 students out of the 250 turned their papers in on time. And and he said to them, he said, look, I told you last time, I said, I I gave you grace that time, gave you mercy, but I told you you were going to get an F if you didn't turn it in on time. And they said, oh, we're so sorry, we really tried to do that. But, but we're in the midst of midterms and it's homecoming week after all. So, so could we just have a few more days? He said, I told you there was, you're going to get an F. He says, but I'll tell you what, this one more time, I'm going to give you three more days to turn in your paper. Now November 30th rolls around. This time, only 150 of the 250 students turned their papers in on time. So, so he began to ask some of the students where their midterm paper was. He said, Johnson, where's your paper? Well, I don't have it ready, but I'll, I'll get it to you in a couple of days. Don't worry, professor. He said, he pulled out his grade book. He said, that's an F. Smith, where's your, where's your paper? He said, well, well, I don't have it ready, but I know you'll give us a couple more days. I'll have it to you in a couple more days. He took out the grade book, wrote down, that's an F. Finally, someone from the back yells, well, that's not fair. And he said, Fitzgerald, is that you? I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, you want fair, right? He said, in October, you turned your paper in late, right? He says, you're going to get an F for that paper and for this one as well. And then he asked the class, does anyone else want justice? It was very quiet at that point, as you might imagine. And he said what he learned from from that experience is that the very first time that those students, when they got grace and when they got mercy from the professor, that they were amazed by grace. He said the second time, they just assumed that they were going to get it. And he said by the third time, they looked at it as something that they were entitled to, something that they deserved. And I think if we're not careful, frankly, we can do the same thing too, can't we, in our lives? that we can begin to presume upon God's grace and and His mercy. And I think one of the reasons that we do that sometimes is that we don't have a real good understanding of the sovereignty of God. And this morning, as we continue in our study of the book of Romans, we're we're going to come face to face with this idea of the sovereignty of God. And I'm going to tell you right up front, that this is, this is a topic that I don't know about you, but I don't completely understand it. I'm going to tell you right up front that this passage that we're going to look at this morning, I've spent the last two weeks studying and looking at it, and I still don't understand it all. And so what we're going to learn this morning really is, I think, going to stretch these finite minds that we have. And we're not going to understand everything that we're going to read in this passage. And, and I want to just assure you that that's okay that we, we can have a little bit of mystery about God. We talked about this, that we aren't always going to understand all the things that go that, about God. And that's okay. 
We're going to get this morning uh, to continue in, in, in Romans chapter 9. You'll remember last week we began with that chapter and we said that, that in this chapter Paul's answering a question that arises out of everything that he's taught up till now in his letter all the way through Romans chapter 8. He's been teaching all along about salvation through grace by faith in Jesus Christ. And, and the question that that brings up, especially to his to his fellow Jews is this. If the Jews have rejected, largely rejected Jesus, which they had at that time, almost the whole church was Gentiles. He says, if the Jews have rejected Jesus, who is the Messiah, then has God's plan for the Jews, has, has it been defeated? And I think that's a logical question to ask, right? And as we saw last week, it was a question that was really relevant to the Jews, but it was also relevant to the Gentiles because if God's promises to the Jews didn't come to pass, then how could the Gentiles count on the promises that we saw a few weeks ago in Romans chapter 8? Promises like this, that all things will work for the good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Or the promise that nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. And so what Paul does in chapter 9 is he takes these five events from the history of Israel, and he uses them to prove that in fact, not only has God's promise not failed, but that it's been carried out through Jesus Christ, that he is the fulfillment of God's plan that God had from the very beginning of time. Last week we began looking at chapter 9, and we saw how, how Paul begins by just pouring out his heart. Remember the heart he had for, he says, Basically, hey, I would give up my salvation if all the rest of you could have faith in Jesus Christ and be saved. Because he has such a heart for them. But now as we get to verse 6, he's going he's to actually begin to answer the question that's been, that's been raised by this whole idea. And as he does that, we're going to see very clearly some things about the sovereignty of God this morning. And while we may not be able to fully understand everything about the sovereignty of God... I'm hopeful that I can at least show you enough from this passage that you can take away and that you can apply to your life. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out to Romans chapter uh, 9 this morning. Romans chapter 9. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 6 and go through verse 18 this morning. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. So he starts out, he gives the conclusion right off the bat. And now he's going to give the evidence to show that in fact that's true. As I said, there's five things he's going to lay out, five instances. We're going to look at three of them this morning in this passage. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the, of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return. And Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever, whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. I'm going to begin with the main idea here this morning, and then we'll kind of see if we can't see why that is the case. The main idea um, this morning is this, that God only chooses those who choose him and only rejects those who reject him. Now that might seem kind of straightforward up front, 
But I'm going to tell you it's not quite as easy as it might seem. Because you can take this statement and you can look at it from two perspectives. You can look at it from God's perspective. And if you read it from God's perspective, that statement, here's what it says, something like this. That God chooses whoever He wants to. And then the ones that God chooses end up choosing Him. And God rejects those that He wants to reject. And those who He rejects ends up rejecting Him. So you can look at it from that perspective. Or you could look at it from the human perspective, right? Which is what we usually like to do, let's be honest. And if we look at it that way, then, then we read it more like this. Well, if I choose God, then God will choose me. And if I reject God, then God will reject me, right? See the difference between the two? And you could read that statement either way. And what we're going to see this morning is kind of mind-blowing because here's what I'm going to tell you, they're both true doesn't seem like that's possible to our finite human minds, does it? These, these two things, they seem like they can't be reconciled. And yet, you know what? The Bible teaches both things. And we're going to see that this morning very clearly. So just because I can't get my human mind wrapped around it does not mean that they're not both true. Unfortunately, what's happened within Christianity is, is people have tended to latch on to one or the other. Of those things and they formed whole camps around them and then these camps kind of like war against each other and they try to to prove that they're right and that the other side is wrong and they have names associated with them which I'm not even going to throw out there this morning you guys are probably familiar with that but they're both true and that's what we're going to see this morning and Paul begins as I said he begins with the conclusion here he says no God's plan has not failed and then he's going to give all these examples, and we're going to look at three of them this morning. The first example he gives is the one of Ishmael and Isaac. And, and for those of you who might not be real familiar with that story, let me just kind of hit some of the highlights that are really relevant to us this morning. You remember that God, God comes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make you into this great nation. And through that nation that I will make you into you're going to bless all the other nations of the world. And then a few chapters later, he comes back and he expounds upon that promise that he's given. He says, Abraham, he says, you know what? Your descendants are going to be so numerous that they're going to be like the stars in the sky or like the, the grains of sand on the seashore. And that sounds really great, but here's the problem. Abraham and his wife Sarah, they get to be pretty old. They're beyond childbearing years and they still don't have it have a child so they come up with their own plan actually Sarah comes up with the plan she says look I I'm getting too old to have kids why don't you go in with my maid Hagar an Egyptian woman and you can have a child with her so they kind of take those things into their own hand even though God had already promised he was going to give them a child and a child is born out of that a child named Ishmael and Ishmael becomes the father of the Arabs today. They all descend from Ishmael. But lo and behold, Ad, or, uh, Abraham gets to be 99 years old and Sarah's 89 and guess what happens? God comes and he enables them to have a child. And they have a child and his name is Isaac. And God says to them, he says, it's through Isaac that your descendants are going to come. And Isaac becomes the father of the Israelites or of the Jews. So we can trace that, that conflict that we see today all the way back to then. You wonder why that conflict is so hard to try to settle today? It's because it goes all the way back to, the, to that time. And, and what Paul says here, he says that, that God, he chose Isaac. He didn't choose Ishmael. And the Jews, they had believed all along that all you had to do, if you want to be blessed by God, just be able to trace your ancestry back to Abraham. And that means that, that, that you belong to Abraham, you're one of the Jews, so therefore you're blessed by God and you're good, you know? You're going to get into heaven. You'll be all right. Remember in, what was it, John 8, where Jesus is talking to, the, to a lot of them and they're going, well, our father's Abraham, who's your father? Because they just believe, trace my, my lineage back to Abraham, we're good, we're in. And what Paul says, no, that's not true here. He says, even if you could trace your lineage back to Abraham, not all his children were children of promise. Not all Israel is Israel. 
he says here. Matter of fact, just if you go back and read, Abraham actually gets another wife after Sarah dies. He has even more kids there. He said, no, it's only, it's only Isaac. So, so from the very beginning, he's teaching this idea here that it was God's plan from the very beginning that not all Israel was going to be saved. It was only going to be a remnant. And so the Jews might have looked at that and they thought, okay, I can live with that. And they began to think, well, maybe, maybe the reason for that is because, because Ishmael's mom wasn't a Hebrew, wasn't a Jew, wasn't an Israelite. I mean, after all, she was an Egyptian. So, so maybe it's just because the lineage wasn't pure on that side of the family that God only chose Isaac and not Ishmael. So guess what Paul does? He says, I'll answer that objection. I'll give you a second example here. I'm going to give you the example of Jacob and Esau. And again, let me just give you a little background here in case you're not totally familiar, or maybe just to, to, to refresh your memory. Is that Isaac eventually marries a woman named Rebecca. That's a really interesting story in and of itself. We could spend a whole lot of time there. And he marries Rebecca, and, and they're not able to get pregnant for a while. It's kind of a repeat of what happens with Abraham and Sarah. But they pray to God. God enables, enables Rebecca to get pregnant. And within her, she has these two sons, Esau and Jacob. And before they're ever born, God comes to Rebekah and reveals to her that the younger, Jacob, is going to serve the older, Esau. That was totally against the way the culture worked back in that day. It says, And Paul points it out here. Before they were ever born, before they could do anything that would that cause God to either favor them or not favor them, he chose Jacob and he rejected Esau. God made that choice here. And we see that. It's really interesting that once they're born, we actually see them live that out in their lives. We find that, that Jacob, the one who God chose, eventually chooses God. Now, Jacob had a lot of his own problems, right? Would you agree with that? I mean, the way he gets the birthright and the way he gets the blessing is that he works in concert with his mother and he deceives Esau and he deceives Isaac in order to get that. But if you look at the whole of Jacob's life, what you'll find is that he eventually seeks out God. He's someone that has a heart after God. It tells us even that he one night he wrestles with God and that after that time, God renames him and says, from now on, your name is not going to be Jacob, it's going to be Israel, and I'm going to name my people after you. At the same time, we see that, that Esau really lives out the fact that God rejected him. I mean, Esau wants nothing to do with God. The birthright, which, which included some spiritual blessings, the blessing that he could have gotten from his father, he says, that's okay, I'm willing to give all that stuff up for a bowl of stew. He was willing to trade the blessings of God for some kind of temporary pleasures. And, and we see people that do that all the time today, don't we, in this world? And so, the one who God rejected, we see that, that he really lives that out in his life. And so what we see here is that, that, that over this time, the, the Jews who believe that just because they came from Abraham, Paul's pointing out that's not enough. It's not enough to just have a heritage that comes from Abraham. It's not enough to do anything for God because, because Jacob and Esau, it, it makes it really clear here, God chose them before they were born, before they could do anything to either, to either choose God or reject God. God made that decision because God was sovereign. So he lays out these examples here to let us know that God chooses those who choose him and he only rejects those who reject him. And then he comes finally to the third example that we're going to see here this morning. Actually, before I do that, let me point out one more thing. He, this is important. He, he confirms this whole idea here by quoting from Malachi chapter 1. And he quotes, and what does he say? He says, Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. Now, anyone else here have a problem with that? I mean, be honest. 
doesn't really sound right, does it? I mean, doesn't it offense, kind of offend your sense of sensibility and everything? How could, how could the Bible say that God loves some? Doesn't he just love everybody? And because of that, here's, here's what a lot of people have tried to do over the years. They've, they've tried to explain this away in some way. And usually it takes one of two forms. The first form is this. If you go back to Malachi chapter 1, you will find out that in the context that's written there, that God is talking about the nations that came from Jacob and Esau. He's talking about Israel and he's talking about Edom. And so some people say, well, that, he's just talking about nations there. He's not really talking about individuals. God didn't choose one individual and reject another one. But that, doesn't that really fly in the face of everything that Paul's been writing here? He's, he's talking about individuals, and he quotes this verse to support the fact that, that God loved one of them and he hated the other. Here's the other way that people try to kind of explain this away. They'll say, well, it's kind of like Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Remember what Jesus said there? He says, if you want to follow after me, you have to do what? You have to hate your mother and your father and your brothers and sisters. And they say, what Jesus said there, he doesn't really mean you have to hate him. You just have to not like him as much as you like Jesus or not love them as much as you love Jesus. So really what God's saying here is it's, it's just saying that, that God didn't really love Esau quite as much as he loved Jacob. I don't think that's true either. You know what? Go back, go back to the Old Testament and look at every time it says that God hates something. And it says that a lot. You know what the word hate means every time that it's used in the Old Testament? It means hate. So, so how do we explain this then? I, I really like how, uh, how um, one of the pastors of old times explained this. Somebody came to him and said to this pastor, says, you know, I just, I can't accept this whole idea that God would hate Esau. I just can't accept that. And what the pastor turned around and said to this woman, he said, you know, for me, what I can't understand is how God could love Jacob. And I think that's really true. If we would think about it in that way, I can understand how God could hate me. What I can't understand is how he could love me. And so we just have to accept that even though it, it offends us and, and we can't understand that. And, and that what that brings up is this whole idea then is if God is, is just free to choose whoever He wants, that's just not fair. I mean, that's the question that's really arising here, right? And isn't that a question you would like to ask sometimes? I mean, if God can choose some but not others, is, is that really fair? And that's the question that He's going to answer here with the third example He gives, the example of Moses and Pharaoh. He starts with Moses and, and he quotes from the book of Exodus where God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I want to have mercy and I will have compassion on whoever I want to have compassion. And that goes all the way back to, the, to when Moses came down from the mountain after he got the Ten Commandments and the people had made this golden calf out there and God, he punishes them. He, he has the Levites go and kill 3,000, go through the, the camp and you know, 3,000 of them are killed. And Moses comes before God, and what Moses wants to know from God, he says, God, basically he's asking, God, are you going to show mercy to me? And that's how God responds. He says, I'll, I'll show mercy to whoever I want to show mercy. I'll show compassion to whoever I want to show compassion. And what he's showing Moses there, he's saying that, that Moses, I'll show you mercy, but my mercy is not based on anything that you did. It's not based on who you are. It's not based on anything else except for the fact that I have chosen to show mercy to you. My choice. And then he now contrasts that with Pharaoh here. And he says, you know what? I also chose Pharaoh. But I chose Pharaoh to harden his heart so that I could bring these plagues against Egypt so that I could show my power and I could show my glory and so that all the nations of the earth would know who I am. And believe me, after God brought the plagues upon Egypt, 
Egypt, all the people of the earth, they knew who God was. They understood how powerful he was. They understood that he was sovereign. I want to I want to pause for just a minute to kind of talk about the idea that that here where it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Because again, that raises another question, doesn't it? I mean, did God just raise Pharaoh up and make him a robot who had no choice in that? So, so, so therefore, he had to harden his heart? I mean, again, that doesn't seem fair. Paul's going to deal with that whole question even in more detail when we get to verse 19 next week. Because that is a question I'd ask, right? If God chooses some and others, well, if God doesn't choose me, then I'm not responsible for anything I do. I mean, that seems reasonable, right? But if you go back and you read in Exodus, it's really interesting. I think, I don't remember the numbers here, but there are a bunch of times where it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And there's also a bunch of times where it says that God hardened his heart. So the question is, which one is it? Did Pharaoh harden his heart or did God harden his heart? Both. They're both in the Bible. They have to both be true, right? But here's how I think that works. It's really clear from the beginning that, that, that Pharaoh did the things he did because he had an evil heart. God didn't do that to him. Sin did that to him. And he hardened his heart and he hardened his heart. You know what God did? God just allowed the whole process to play out, so to speak. And to come to its logical end at which his heart would become so completely hardened that he couldn't possibly turn to God. And we see that really throughout the Bible that that happens, that, that God does that. He takes what's already in man and he uses it to accomplish his purposes. I mean, think about Jesus going to the cross. Who nailed him to the cross? A bunch of evil men, right? Who rejected God. Now, did, did they do that because God hardened their hearts or because they hardened their hearts? I think it's both again. What happened is, is they were evil and God used the evil that was in them because of their own sin. He didn't put it there. He used them because of their hardened hearts to carry out the purposes that he had, which was to have his son go to the cross to die and pay the penalty for our sins. And so what we see here is that that both Moses and, and Pharaoh, they demonstrate here the sovereignty of God. And what we see here is that God's justice is carried out both in giving mercy to Moses and in bringing judgment of, against Pharaoh. Those were both just because they both accomplished God's purposes. And God is completely holy and just and righteous. What we do know for sure that it's justice because what did they both deserve? They both deserve God's judgment. It was only because of his mercy that he poured out on Moses because he chose to do that, that Moses received mercy. So God only chooses... Those who choose Him, and He only rejects those who reject Him. And that's that, that divine mystery that we've seen this morning. We see that, that from God's perspective, that He chose Isaac, and He chose Jacob, and He chose Moses. And He did that completely out of His own will, not because they deserved it, and we see that from their perspective, that they also chose God, that, that, that Isaac and Jacob and Moses chose to follow after God. And we also see from God's perspective that he rejected Ishmael, and he rejected Esau, and he rejected Pharaoh, and that they, they went ahead and they rejected God as a result of that from their perspective. Anyone else here still a little confused over this whole thing? I am. I'd be really, I, I'd almost worry if you had this all figured out this morning. Because it, it's hard for us to, to wrap our human minds around. So what I want to do as we close, I want to leave you with three important takeaways. What is there that we can take away 
from what we've learned this morning that will really help us to live out our lives. And here's the first one. That God is free to choose who He wants. It's absolutely true. God is free to choose who He wants. That's what makes Him God, right? He has the ability, regardless of anything else going on, to make those choices that that He wants to make. And that's important for us to understand. And it's also important for us to understand that when He makes those choices... He's making them 100% in accordance with all His attributes of all He is. In accordance with His love and His mercy and His grace and His justice and His righteousness and His holiness and every other attribute that you could think of, God makes His choices in accordance with who He is. So God is completely free to make whatever choice He wants. Here's the second thing that we need to understand about that. That God's choice is not subject to man's conditions. We saw that this morning, right? We saw that with with Ishmael, and we saw it with Esau, and we saw it with Pharaoh. You know, God, God didn't have to make choices because of who they were, or who they were born to, or what they did, whether they were good or evil in their life. God wasn't, He wasn't limited by the choices that man made. He never is. Because guess what would be what would happen? If God were subject to our conditions, who would be God? We would, right? If God had to choose based on what we did, He wouldn't be God anymore. We would. And so so God can make those choices completely separate from anything that we do, from who we are. He makes those choices completely separate. And then third, and this is really important, is that God's sovereignty does not preclude man's responsibility. See, it would be really, we're going to deal with this more next week, but it would be really easy to say, well, hey, look, if God's just sovereign, He makes all these choices, then I'm just like a robot, so hey, I'm not responsible for my own sin. But we see that's clearly not the case here. This morning, we see that with Ishmael, and particularly we see it with, uh, with Esau and with Pharaoh, that they made choices and that God held them responsible for the choices that they made. And again, we might not understand all this, but that's really clear from the passage today. So God only chooses those who choose Him, and God only rejects those who reject Him. And I want to leave you this morning with this thought. This is really good news. Matter of fact, this is great news. This morning, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, that means that God chose you and you chose Him. And you know why it's such great news? Because it means that the salvation that you have, you didn't do anything to earn or deserve it. God did it all on your behalf. And guess what? Because you didn't do anything to deserve it or earn it, you can't lose it either. God's got you held firmly in His hands. And so you ought to be thanking God for that every single day of your life. And I want to encourage you in just a few moments as we have a time to pray, just to say, God, thank you so much for choosing me. For those of you who have not yet made that decision in your life, it's still good news. You know why? Because it means there's nothing that you have done in your life that's so bad that God can't still choose you and you still can't choose Him. Nothing. And so I want to encourage you, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, to to do that today, to respond to the call of God as He's speaking to your spirit through His Holy Spirit this morning. We sing our final song, some of our elders will be at the back, and they would love to talk to you more about what it means to to enter into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. R.C. Sproul, he uh, passed away here recently, I think in December of last year. But I love what he said about this whole thing that we need to keep in mind as we close today. We are secure Not because we hold tightly to Jesus, but because He holds tightly to us. Let's pray.
Uh, Father, thank you that we can, we can say that with confidence, Father. Knowing that we're yours because Jesus holds tightly to us. Father, I want to pray first of all this morning for anyone here who has never put their faith in Jesus. Father, I know that they can't do that without you choosing them, without you calling them, without you drawing them to you. And I ask this morning that you would do that. Pray even now that you might be speaking to their spirit through your Holy Spirit, drawing them to you. And Father, for the rest of us who have already experienced the grace that comes from you, who have already been chosen by you, Father, we just humbly say thank you. Because, Father, all of us were once dead. We were once separated from you. And we could do nothing on our own to be reunited with you. We thank you that through Jesus that you've made that possible. And we thank you for your call upon our life. Thank you for choosing us when there was nothing in our lives that was worthy of being chosen, Father. We're grateful and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we want to, uh, to honor God with our offerings. We've done that through song. We've done that through His Word. And we do that each week by giving back to God out of that which He has entrusted so Derek's going to come read our uh, scripture passage and pray for us. We'll take our offering and then we'll sing the final song. Again, this morning, if, if God's put something on your heart, if you have a decision to make for Jesus, if you'd like someone just to pray with you, our elders will be at the back as we close this morning. Our scripture comes today from 2 Corinthians verses, or chapter 9, verses 10 through 12. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Fathers, we come before you. Uh, we, we pray for this offering. Lord, we know that uh, really our, our money and, and all of our earthly possessions, they're really yours that we're just being good stewards of. So Lord, we pray that you allow us to be very generous with that. Lord, we know that we give uh, because we are blessed by you. We know that we don't give to become blessed. And Lord, we know that all of the givings that we give, you're able to multiply for your kingdom. So Lord, just uh, please bless this offering we're about to take and please bless us as we finish this day.
benediction this morning comes from Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you.